Our next presentation, Alex Just, Director of Program Development at iPlatform. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Malik Dahlan has kindly given up his slot to introduce me today because he wanted young people to have more time at this conference. And I think it's very important that there is a time for young people's voices to be heard. We've had a lot of talk at this conference about young people, about engaging young people, and about things that can be done in this region to make things better. And now what I want to do is very briefly outline one concrete thing which can be done to improve the plight of an important group of young people in the Arab region. In June 2015, Professor Dahlan and Professor Mednikov and I were fortunate enough, thanks to the good offices of His Royal Highness Prince Hamza bin Hussein, to visit the Zatari refugee camp in Jordan. When we visited that camp, there were 83,496 people living there. This is the same as the number of people who can fit in the Florida State University sports stadium, or the number of people who will be able to watch the final of the FIFA World Cup when it's held in the Lusail Stadium in Qatar in 2022. And of that population, 47,592 of those people are youth. That means, ladies and gentlemen, that 57% of the population of Zatari is made up of young people. Now, the Jordanian government and the UN agencies are doing an extraordinary job in very difficult situations to provide education. And there are 15,500 school children who are enrolled in primary and secondary education programs in Zatari. Last year, 57 of those students uh, so 15,500, I should just say, is the same as the number of students who are currently studying for undergraduate degrees at my alma mater, the University of Oxford. And of that population, 57 of them are taking the Taujihi High School uh, graduation exam. And we were very privileged to meet some of those remarkable young people in Zatari. Mohammed, who you can see proudly wearing his Manchester City soccer shirt, he told us that he wanted to be a lawyer. His dream was to go to university and study law and Sharia. And we met other young people, really remarkable men, young men and young women, who dreamed of becoming doctors, of becoming entrepreneurs, pharmacists, civil servants. And they all told us passionately their belief that in the future what they wanted to do was continue their education and then go back to Syria to help rebuild their communities. They want to go and be the next generation of Arab young professionals. They want to be able to help their families. They want to be able to set up businesses. They want to be able to deliver public services again. But ladies and gentlemen, last year, no people graduated from universities in Zatari. And we at iPlatform hope to change that. For the last four years, we've been working hard to set up a network of relationships of some of the leading academic institutions in the Arab world, in the US, and in the UK. We work with the likes of the University of Cambridge, with Harvard Law School, and with the University of Jordan. And our endeavors are supported by a diverse and talented academic board, led by the distinguished Professor David Mednikov, who some of you will have met, and who's a delegate at this conference. At iPlatform, though, we don't think that learning should take place in an academic vacuum. So we're also trying to get the support of some of the leading corporates uh, in the region. And we think that that very much has to be part of the solution. So our goal, for example, is for Mohammed to be able to take a course about the rule of law supported by the International Bar Association, or for students to be able to study the latest pharmaceutical technologies with the research underpinned by an industry leader like Mundi Pharma. We want students to gain skills that are not only useful for them in the immediate sense, but will also help them in the next chapters of their lives. And crucially, we want them to feel as proud of their education as I do of my degree from Oxford. I think Kareem said something very interesting in the last panel about giving hope to these young people. And it's important that we give young people in places like Zatari, in places where there is despair and there is a lot of problems, 
something to look forward to, something to aspire to. And so to give one example, what we hope to do is to provide some young people in the camp with the chance to take a course in solar energy, to provide them with the theoretical understanding of solar technologies underpinned by research from leading engineering faculties around the world and supported by Green Gulf, an industry leader, but to also allow those young people to understand the practical vocational skills so that they know how to install and repair solar panels. Now, some of you might have seen the remarkable film Solar Mamas, which was directed uh, by Jahan, who was another one of our panelists earlier today. Now, that took women, often grandmothers, from rural communities. Uh, one featured in the film is a Jordanian Bedouin grandmother, and she went in six months to Barefoot College in in, uh, India and learned how to install and electrify her village. That is something, if that can be done for six months for grandmothers, we think that that's something that can also be achieved for young people in Zatari. We want them to be able to do that because it's useful today for their time in the camp, but also in the future, because we think that if they don't uh, stay in, in Zatari or they don't return to Syria, these skills will be useful for when they return, uh, if they emigrate to other countries. So briefly, to show you our delivery partners, Blue Drop are a leading Canadian e-technology partner. They've said that they'll put the system in place so we can deliver this training in the cloud and provide a passport so the young people can move on and have the ability to be able to take their education with them. We've got DataWind, who is a, a technology um, expert in data and video compression. So for just $40 on tablets like this, we can deliver some of these courses. It's an affordable, cost-effective system. But more than that, we want the students to be able to have the, the mentoring and the comradeship that you get from university. So with Celia, we're working to give them the chance to have other students help them, to teach them what they understand and what they know about the subjects that they're studying. And that's something that we think that's very important. And finally, the classroom learning. We want them to be able to go to places like the University of Jordan, like Al Bay University, and get the classroom applied academic uh, skills of professors to help them with their endeavors. We really are very proud of what we're doing. I am uh, not from this region, but I love this region, and I love its people, and I'm very proud of the work that I've done with young people in the past. And I said in my session, I hope that next year, it's not a Scottish voice you'll be hearing advocating for change for young people in the Arab world. I hope it's an Arab voice. Uh, but I thank you very much for your time and your support. Thank you, Ran. العرض التالي مع سعادة الدكتورة حياة سندي عضو مجلس الشورى السعودي والرئيسة التنفيذية ومؤسسة معهد التخيل والبراعة. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين. Your Royal Highnesses, Your Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. I'm so honored to be with you here this afternoon, and thank you very much for your invitation. I'm going to take you through some points of my own understanding of social innovation and why now the whole world are talking the language, my language. When I was a child, I used to play with the magnet, and I think we all did. It was fascinating to see the power of magnets move things without any physical wires. At the same time, you cannot explain it totally, because the force works in an invisible way. So frustrating, you cannot take it apart to find out what's going on. So you must rely on your imagination to explain what you see and what does it mean. Even asking your teacher for explanation of the magnet is not satisfying. That's because the understanding of our science is not complete. The size of the unknown is huge, vast, and the way we know, and the, the only we know a small bit of it. I'm really surprised by our lack of change approach that we are still teaching our children the same thing again and again. Our confidence with our great theories may be too much, making us overestimate what we know and ignore experiments, our observations that don't conform. 
I'm really getting worried about some of the core truths we have, our foundation theories that we use for our modern technology have not changed for well over a century. They are frozen in time, collecting dust. Maybe a clue as to why this may be is our lack of confidence, scientific confidence, that we have elevated the heroes in the past to such a height, and it takes extraordinary confidence to think once one can do better. So new, amazing ideas of imaginative scientists who don't come from the right place or who claim to break scientific laws tend to get thrown away and shut down in a flame. Some would say this is the scientific process. However, I think we have stopped being open to wonderful, powerful, extraordinary ideas. We ignore new evidence and follow scientific heroes because we are safe and strong on the shoulders of giants. I believe the antidote is to fire up our imagination, start to paint new picture of the future. We need to keep humanity evolving. The fuel for scientist imagination is observation. And the value is when we are, are truly open, letting the deepest meaning of nature come to the surface so we can continue to create amazing technology and engineer it to fit people's way of life. I would say social innovation has helped me to see a clear vision of the complex world. Social innovation is about building strategies, concept ideas that strengthen civil society, which then satisfies social needs such as working conditions, education, community, and health. So why is social innovation in the news now? The world's population has grown over 7 billion today. The world now faces famine, war, killing viruses, and depression. Very sad to say, very tough lives for people in the East and the West. Thus, the way we live and do business is being questioned. Can we use social innovation to improve our lives? Is science involved? Nowadays, science is different. Science is becoming more human. In the poor areas of the developing world, many people are deprived from the benefit of science and technology. So being smart and having resources is not enough for true break innovation to change people's lives. We need to aim science at the social issues in order to make the impact then we can customize science to people's needs according to an infrastructure and way of life. We want science targeted at social issues, so from the start, science linked to society. I really woke up to this terrible loss for, for our people when I was at Harvard at Whiteside Lab. We developed in the lab a unique type of sensor made from paper. Then we established a company based on this invention called Diagnostic for All. Diagnostic for All mission is to provide affordable, low-cost diagnostic tool to help everyone. It helps the poor people everywhere in the world. It will eventually save millions of lives every year. It replaces huge machines and puts the power of the scientific lab at the patient's fingertips, who cannot access doctor, who cannot access hospital, who cannot access equipment, so they can monitor their health and provide a better way of life. The technology is simple, it's not expensive, and it doesn't require power supply, nor reagents, and it can give you a result within a minute. Yet, when I left Harvard, I still felt the full potential of social innovation has not, has not been achieved. Students were still fixed on their careers, getting tenures and making publications. I remember asking them to think more outside the box, to use their imagination, and to be open to the science of the, our developed world changing too. 
But I knew this type of change wasn't going to happen overnight. So I had to take a practical step and to work to become a social innovator. To start I2 Institute, an institute for imagination and ingenuity for youth in the Middle East. To create an ecosystem of entrepreneurship and social innovation to inspire young talent, scientists, engineers, and technologists so they can have the chance to make new companies, create new markets, fulfill their potential to their societies and countries. Through this journey, as a scientist, I have asked how to innovate. What exactly should I do to move things forward? And I always ask myself this question. Who is the true scientist? I believe for the scientist is not enough to sit in a lab doing research alone. We need to be out there talking to people to feel and understand their needs to inspire them and put our resulting ideas to work in the real world. For me, becoming a scientist and understanding science gave me the tools to see the big picture. I realized that I could use it to bring benefits to many others, not just for myself. And practically, from my experience, to help to bring the best change for the future, I believe it starts with people's need in the local communities that drive the real innovation. Only people from the community recognize what real needs are. And this is why we need to seed science in those communities. We realize starting with great ideas of science is not enough. Instead, starting with the problems of the local communities is what is needed. Then once we have spotted the need in the communities, we need something else. Our imagination. To find that sparkling solution for a sustainable world. We not only need to think outside the box, we have to think outside the box. Finally, I would like to define imagination in this way. As the confidence to dream about something people will say no to, but you have the confidence to achieve it. And if someone says no, it doesn't mean that you're wrong. It means something is missing in their life they haven't recognized yet. On the other hand, if they said yes, it means they want you to improve something they know that exists. So there will not be the opportunity you hoped for. So keep going against people's rejection, because by doing that you may reveal the missing part that could change their life forever, of course, for a better one. Thank you very much. <laughs>